Lord Jesus Christ, we who have come to you, we who have seen your face, we who have experienced your grace and your love and your presence, you have woken us up to truth and to life and to light and to hope. We pray that today, in a fresh new way, you will wake us up to your presence, to your power, to your goodness, to your plan for our lives. And Lord, any way that the enemy has lulled us to sleep, any way that we're dozing off to the spiritual realities that you so want us to recognize and see, will you speak to our hearts? May we know your plan. May we be committed to follow it. And may we be infused by the power of your Holy Spirit within us to walk in your ways in fresh new ways because we have gathered as your people scattered around this country, around this world, in this worship center, on this campus, but your people united. May we become more who you want us to be. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen. Well, when Sherry and I got married, uh, we had a wonderful wedding celebration in Holland, Michigan. I'm from Orange County, California, so I packed in two cars with five of my closest friends. One was a guy who had spiritually mentored me and kind of helped me come to Jesus. Two were guys that I served together as as a volunteer in volunteer ministry at the church I was part of, and two of them were students who I had kind of helped grow in their faith and their journey of faith, and now they'd grown up, they were college age. And this group of five guys and I got into two cars, and we drove across country, a 2,000-mile drive uh, to, to Holland, Michigan. And what we did is we put three in a car, and we drove in shifts so we could basically drive all the way straight through except for food breaks and bathroom breaks and gas breaks. We drove straight through. So by about the third round of drivers, one of the guys that we were a little concerned about, Mark, one of the guys that was a high school student when I was, first got to know him and was volunteering at the church, um, Mark had this, this spiritual gift of sleeping. Um, <laughs> Mark could fall asleep anywhere. It was really a gift he had. I don't know if it was a spiritual gift, but he could fall asleep anywhere. And we, we put him in the last rotation. So I'd be driving one car, kind of the trail car, and he'd be driving the lead car. I'd follow him. And so we got into our, you know, got into our cars, you know, had a little break, and then started driving. About 15 minutes in, at this point, we're probably in Wyoming somewhere. I think it was pretty open country. About 15 minutes in, we're driving. I'm behind him, and he just starts kind of drifting to the left lane, and then he kind of pulls back real quick and kind of drifts off to the right lane and pulls back real quick. And I'm going... I know he hasn't been drinking, um, and I, but I'm thinking, he can't, we've been driving 15 minutes, he can't be getting tired already. And then he finally kind of drifts off to the right and almost, almost hit the dirt on the side of the road and pulled back in again. I'm thinking, I got to figure out what's going on. So I kind of, sl- kind of went around and came up alongside of him, and I looked over at the car next to me, and there's two guys, the other guys I think are out sleeping, but he's, he's driving and he's sort of driving. He has his hands on the steering wheel. And his forehead is on the steering wheel. And his eyes are closed. It's true as I'm standing here. So I figured out why he was drifting from place to place, right? So I honked the horn. It was a Subaru. It was a Subaru. (laughs) And I look, nothing. I honk again. Nothing. I honk a third time. Now I I go, Mark, wake up, wake up. He can't hear me. I honk again. He finally, he wakes up. He goes like this. Looks over and sees me. He goes, and he smiles and he waves at me like nothing's going on. And I'm like, pull over, pull over, get on the, and we got to the side of the road. And I went up and I said, I said, Mark, what are you doing? And he goes, well, I was getting tired. And sometimes when I'm driving, I get tired just for like two or three seconds. I just rest my forehead on the steering wheel. This is true. Deadly. Needless to say, we didn't let Mark drive uh, anymore at that point because he didn't understand the concept that as you drive on a, on a road going across country, you're supposed to stay awake. Um, our message today, our theme we're going to learn from the church of Sardis as Jesus, the, you know, the risen, powerful Lord Jesus Christ, speaks to the church of Sardis and speaks to our church today and speaks to God's people today. Here's our message today. It's time to wake up. It's time to wake up. There is a need for revival. Not, not, not physical waking up, but spiritual awakening. We need awakenings in our hearts, awakenings in our homes, awakenings in our marriages, an awakening of God in the church, awakening nationally, globally. We're dozing off. We're putting our head on the steering wheel of life. 
and slowly drifting off the road. And the consequence can be massive. And so each week as, we, as we're walking through the book of Revelation and we're using chapters 2 and 3, the letters of the churches, as kind of our springboard to take us into this, the message of the book of Revelation, the call of Jesus on the church today, we talk about getting, a, getting the picture, kind of having a vision. And I want you, as you listen to this passage, as you follow along, if you have your own Bibles, turn to Revelation chapter 3. If you have a Bible app or if you have your iPad or whatever, you want to open up to Revelation chapter 3. We'll have it on the screens here and at home or wherever you are online. And as I read this passage, I want to ask you to try to kind of picture what's going on. Remember, revelation is that, it's a vision, it's a revelation. And I want you to kind of identify this theme of waking up. How Jesus, and remember, every one of the letters of the churches begins with a picture of Jesus. It's drawn from chapter 1, this vision of Jesus. And then it says, it points to Jesus as the one who had all those attributes. And so these are the words of Jesus to the church of Sardis, but I believe also to the church today and to believers today. So what's Jesus saying? To the church. Revelation 3, verses 1 through 6. To the angel of the church of Sardis, write These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. That's Jesus. And here's what he says I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. It goes beyond just sleepwalking. He's saying, spiritually, you're dead. Wake up, verse 2 says, wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. So remember, therefore, what you have received, what you've heard. Hold it fast and repent, turn around. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what time I come to you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out that, the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. I love that. Jesus says, I will acknowledge your name before my Father and his angels. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Jesus Christ, may we have ears to hear today. May we listen intently. May not only our our ears be open, but may our hearts be open and our lives be open to you, Jesus. You who called us to take up the cross and follow you, to follow you with all of our lives. May this be a defining day. A day of revival. A day of repentance. A day of new beginnings. A day of life. Because we have heard your word and listened to the truth that the Spirit of God speaks to the children of God. And because we have been willing to follow you and repent and turn and live in a new way. Speak to our hearts, Jesus. We pray this in your name and for your glory. Amen. I want to invite you today, wherever you are, to just quiet your heart for a minute and honestly, humbly before God. Ask this question. Where am I sleepwalking spiritually? What's an aspect of my spiritual life that other people would say, well, she's doing great. But God would say, man, you're on the edge of death. See, appearances can be deceiving. We can appear a certain way to our spouse, to our children, to our friends, to our church. But we can't appear in a way that we are not to our God. He knows us and he loves us. And like the Spirit of God and like Jesus Christ our Lord and like our Heavenly Father was honking the horn saying to the church of Sardis, wake up, wake up. I know that people think you're alive but I know you're dead and you're about to you're completely die. Wake up. Just, just like the Spirit of God was speaking then, the Spirit of God is speaking today. I believe that each of these letters to the churches is contained in Scripture and held there because they were different kinds of churches dealing with different things, but all that those churches dealt with, we deal with today. And if you look at your life, and if you say, you know, I really, I'm digging deep, I cannot find any attitude in me that's not perfect. I cannot find a single behavior in my life that doesn't perfectly meet Jesus' standards. I cannot think of any behavior I'm involved in that doesn't absolutely delight the holy God of heaven. 
If you can't identify anywhere where right now there may be a need for revival in your heart, then bow your knees before Jesus and say, forgive me for my pride because I think I'm perfect in your sight. Now, in Jesus, through faith in him, we're made clean, we're made perfect, and we will stand before God, and God will say, what sin? Your sin is washed away. All right? We're saved by God's grace through Jesus. And when we receive Jesus, our sins are washed away. But we continue to say, like the Apostle Paul does in Romans 7, that there's a battle in this world. Sometimes the things I don't want to do, I do. Sometimes the things I hate, I do. The things I want to do, I fail to do. And so today, would you just say, Spirit of God, would you just whisper in my heart at least one area that there needs to be revival, a change, repentance, turning back to God. And just let the Lord speak to your heart. And as he does, don't fight it off. But say, Lord Jesus, through your word, speak to me. When we look at this vision in the first six verses of Revelation chapter 3, there's just some things that should come out and we should strike us. First, that God is present. God's alive. God's engaged. Uh, God is part of our lives. When you see Jesus speaking to the church, to all these churches, you see that God cares. His church matters to him. His people matter to him. God is alive. God is present. You can't read the letters of the churches and think that God is kind of distant, removed, and doesn't care. He cares, and he cares when we're heading for a cliff. He cares when we're veering off the road and about to flip the car in a you know, cornfield in the middle of Wyoming. He cares. He honks. He says, wake up. Why? Because he loves us. He cares about his children. He cares about our spiritual condition, that we will be spiritually alive. God actually speaks. God continues to say, wake up, repent, turn, follow me. God knows the best life is a life surrendered to him, following him. And the world says, but try this, taste this, enjoy this, sample this. And God says, I have so much more. And we kind of drink from the toilet when God offers living water. The world offers us tainted, poisoned water. God offers living water. And we sometimes just end up drinking the wrong things, eating at the, you know, eating at the trough of the world. That doesn't mean that there aren't great things in this world. I mean, the, the Bible's clear that God made the world, and there's beauty in this world that we should appreciate and enjoy and preserve. But if, we're, if, we're, if we've been misled by the enemy, it's time to wake up and to listen and to hear the heart of God. He's seeking to protect his children because he loves us. So one more aspect of Revelation that I want to look at. If you have your Bibles, turn to Revelation chapter 7. And I want to read verses 9 through 14. I want to continue to paint this picture of this vision. And here, what happens in chapter 7 is it kind of builds off what we read about in chapter 3 in the letter of the church of Sardis, that, th that those who follow him, he says, they'll be dressed in white. And there's this picture of these ones who are dressed in white. This picture of, of, being, of being cleansed, of being with God one day in glory. And we know that cleansing comes from Jesus, but it's also part of kind of walking with Jesus in this life. So look, look for that picture of those, and, and again, in your mind, just picture, it's, it's a vision, we're supposed to see this. And so let this unfold in your mind. Revelation 7, 9. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. This is God's people in heaven one day. This is the church, these are the saved in heaven one day. From every nation, every tribe, every people, every language. And they were standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and around the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne, and they worshiped God, saying, Amen, may it be. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they? And where did they come from? And I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. The source of cleansing is Jesus Christ crucified. On the cross, bearing our sins, taking our shame. Saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because as our sin was poured on him and he took the judgment and the shame, 
He who had been in perfect harmony with the Father eternally in some mysterious way that we can't fully comprehend felt a separation from the Father because he who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. That's what the Word of God says. The Lamb of God, he who knew no sin eternally, he became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. This is the Jesus we worship. This is the Jesus who calls out, you know, honk, honk, wake up, wake up, I love you. You're heading off the road. You're heading in a direction that will not bring you life. And even though you think it's bringing life, even though you think it's bringing joy, I know it's leading ultimately to death. And so Jesus calls out because he loves us. In this passage, we have a vision of heavenly worship. We have a vision of hope. The hope that's found in the cleansing of Jesus Christ. And all who come to the cross and all who receive Jesus Christ and confess their sins and take his hand and let him lead their life, all who become followers of Jesus were washed clean. That's the hope we have. But in this life, he still calls to us to live as he would have us live. It's a vision of redemption. He buys us back. He makes us right again. So here's a question for you. Are you a light sleeper or a heavy sleeper? Huh, huh, huh. Any sound. <laughs> or <laughs> nothing wakes you up. Are you a light sleeper or a heavy sleeper? I'm a pretty heavy sleeper. When I'm asleep, talking about physical sleep now, when I'm asleep, I'm out. But when we were early on in our marriage, and when Sherry was pregnant with our first of our three boys, uh, we found out that Sherry, a, a lot of women, when they get pregnant, they'll do like for a month, they'll feel kind of sick, maybe three months, feel kind of sick. Sherry totally went for it. She was sick for all nine months. Um, <laughs> commitment, this woman, commitment. And so for nine months, with all three of our, the pregnancies, nine months, sick. I mean like up two or three times at night, um, talking to the porcelain, uh, uh, Ralph, the porcelain, and the, you know, anyway, she didn't feel well. And so I made a commitment to her when she would be sick, and I, I would get up with her, and my job was to kind of hold her hair back, and to give her a little cup with some water to kind of drink, and then to give her little tissues to wipe her mouth, and that, that's how we were in it together. And I learned at that time that when she was getting up, I sort of, even though I would normally be a deep sleep, I would kind of pop right up. And as best an attitude I could, because this is two or three times a night sometimes, we'd get up and we'd go to the bathroom together. And then when each of our boys was born, I said, okay, well, we're in this together. Since I can't, you know, when she was breastfeeding initially, I said, I can't breastfeed him. Uh, I, I said, I'll get, the, the, I'll get Zach, I'll bring him to you, and then when you're done, you wake me up and I'll put him back in bed. That'll be my contribution. So, so I'd get every time that, that we'd have to feed at night, I'd get up tw- two times. So I, lear- I learned to be a lighter sleeper, even though by nature I'm a heavy sleeper. Here's my prayer for all of us, that spiritually we would be light sleepers. That when God says, hey, hey, come on, you know, but you, that, that's not who you are anymore, we'll go, okay. We won't go, <laughs> and ignore it, right? When the Spirit of God says, I love you, but where you're heading right now, what you're doing, this is not my plan for you. That, that God could whisper to us, and we pop up, and say, okay, Lord, how are you leading me? Because my friend Mark, as we were driving to Michigan, he was sleeping pretty heavy, in the car driving, and that, that can happen to us spiritually. We say, well, I believe in Jesus. I put faith in him. I'm saved. Came to the cross. But, we're, but, but we sleep through all these opportunities where God is speaking and wanting to lead, lead us. And this is what God is saying to the church in Sardis. I believe this is what God is saying to the church today. And so as, as we think about this idea of, of waking up, of revival, of God reviving something within us, here's what we have to understand, that God is awake, God is aware, and God is engaged. The God we worship is a God who is awake to what we're, where we're at. He's watching over us. He's engaged. We don't believe in this kind of this vague, hazy theism. Oh, there's a God out there somewhere, and he kind of got things started, but he doesn't really care what we're doing. He doesn't get involved in our lives. He, God is actively engaged. You know, how, you know how engaged the living God is, the God of the Bible is? When we put our faith in Jesus. So if you're a Christian, this is true of you. If you're not yet, and you become a Christian, this will be true of you. When you become a Christian, the very presence of the the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit of God, moves into you and lives inside of you and never leaves. That's engagement. God's not off there somewhere. God is right here. Right here. As we sleepwalk through things, as we doze off and miss things, God still loves us, but he loves us enough to say, wake up. He wants to breathe revival and give a new beginning in our hearts and our lives. We can sleep through God's presence and power 
but it is much better to wake up. It is not good to be a spiritual sleepwalker, to appear like we're, appear like we're awake, but actually to be asleep. And that's what Jesus says to the church of Sardis. You have the appearance of being alive, but you are dead. So strengthen that which is about to die. He says, you're dead, but you're not dead, dead. You're just living like you're dead. But if you're not careful, you know, you may just be be careful. He's, He's waking them up. He literally says, wake up. Don't sleep through this. And, and so, so the vision, and each week in this series, we kind of look at what's, what's, what's the vision, what's the picture we're supposed to see. We see an act of God who's engaged, who's present, who's working with us. We see ourselves tempted to sleepwalk through our lives spiritually, tempted to kind of, kind of just doze off and miss all the opportunities that God gives to us or the calling he puts on our lives or the warnings he gives to us. But then we need to get the message. And I want to share just kind of three really quick messages that, that I think that we can see in the book of Revelation from the letter to the church of Sardis. And just kind of let these speak to your heart. Here, here's, as we get the message, we understand God's truth. Here's one thing. Looks can be deceiving, even in our spiritual lives. Looks can be deceiving. You can look really good spiritually. I can look really good spiritually to the people around us. But we know we're not walking with Jesus the way we should. And God knows where we're at. I think Jesus is saying to the church of Sardis, he's saying to the church today, understand, I know the spiritual condition of your heart. You may have your spouse fooled, you may have your kids fooled, you may have your boss fooled, but God says, I know. And I love you too much to look the other way and ignore it. So I'm gonna honk the horn. I'm gonna say, wake up, because I love you. And I want you to fully experience, God God would say to us, his glory, his power. And so we should ask this question. Does my inner life match up with what people see on the outside? Does my inner life spiritually look like what people think it is? Is there consistency there? A second message that comes through in the letter of the church of Sardis is that deeds can be unfinished in God's sight. It can be that God started doing something in you and you started walking down a road of spiritual growth and growing in the word or or serving your spouse or, or, or teaching your kids about the Bible and raising them to love Jesus. You started down that road of some area of living for Jesus, but it's not finished. You didn't continue. And, and, so, and so look at verse two. It says, wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die. And God, Jesus says this to the church, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. He says, you're heading down the right road, but you got stuck, you got stalled. What is that, what is that area of spiritual growth that God has been speaking to you about? That when you hear it preached about, you go, yeah, I, got, I really got to get a hold of that. I got I to gotta stop that. I got to start that. I got to live this way for my own spiritual growth. And, and you start for a week or a, uh, two weeks or a month or a day or for two hours. And then all of a sudden you got ah, and you give up on it. And maybe God's saying today, it's time to start back in. It's time to step back into that journey of spiritual growth. What is that thing that you started that you knew God wanted for you? It, mi- it might be for some of you as big as a call to ministry. I talked with one of our, one, a person on our worship team today because I had heard that they're making a move soon. I said, hey, where are you moving to? It tends to be Florida, Texas, Colorado. He said, Mexico. We're going to do a five-year time of mission and serve Jesus in this later season of our lives. Following the call. It may be that God has nudged you or led you to say, I need to serve in some way. It may, it may be serving in his church. Where, where, where every time we talk about, hey, we've got this going on with children's ministry, we've got this going on with youth, and, and the Holy Spirit goes, okay, step in. Maybe years ago you thought, I'm going to really get engaged, I'm going to serve in some way, and you just haven't gotten to it. And God says, you haven't finished that journey. Continue on, press into what God has called you to do and who he has called you to be. Our deeds can be unfinished in God's sight. And then a third lesson, a third message that comes through here. We can be sleepwalking through life and look like we're awake, even to ourselves. And sometimes, the, uh, if we're going to really fool other people about what's happening in our lives, we have to fool ourselves first. We have to convince ourselves, yeah, I'm doing great, I'm doing great, yeah. But, but there's times where we look and we know, man, I have areas to grow. I have never, since the day I became a Christian, I have never had a point in my spiritual life where God was not working on me and trying to grow me in at least two or three areas. Areas that I knew were not all he wanted me to be. One of the ongoing works God's been doing with me is controlling my mouth. I'm a preacher, I'm a teacher, I make my living talking. 
but this slippery little tongue. Um, the book of James says the tongue is a fire set on the tongue is set on fire by hell itself. And I can say amen. Because when I'm not careful, when I don't guard myself, I've got a gift for words, and sometimes those words can cut. And can I be honest with you? There's times where, where I feel really hurt and somebody really attacks me. Everything inside of me is like, come on, bring it. And I'm ready to retaliate. Can, is it okay that you're, can your pastor be this honest? I've been battling this my whole life as a Christian. I've been telling people the last month or so, it's been like 18, 19 months in COVID and all this stuff. And, and the different attacks and things that have come. And I don't not complain, it's just a reality. People are hurting, people are struggling. Sometimes out of their anger, their frustration. And sometimes as their pastor, it comes toward me. And I have not lost it once. What that means is I have not said a thousand things that went through my mind. Is this too, am I being too honest? Okay, I'm telling you, okay? And I've been telling people, pray for me for the next four, five, six, seven, ten months, whatever it is, that we're still in the thick of all this because I want to be able to listen to people who are hurting even if they direct their anger at me and their frustration at me and I don't want to retaliate. But I want to tell you, this is a battle for me. I need revival in this part of my life. Sherry and I sat down on the, on, the, on the stoop, the front steps of the parsonage that we lived in in the first, the, the first church I served when we moved to Michigan. We're t- I'm talking about 30 years ago. And I shared with her how caring for my, I knew that the spirit of God was telling me I gotta care for my body. If I'm gonna have a lifetime of ministry, I gotta exercise more, I gotta eat well, I gotta take care of my body. And it has been a battle every week since then. And, and there's seasons where it gets better and I'm doing really well and there's seasons I struggle. But, but, but Jesus never stops saying to me, Kevin, finish what you've started. There's things I'm doing in you that aren't there yet. I'm your pastor. I love Jesus with all my heart. I'm not there yet. But I'm striving and learning and Jesus wants this for all of us. And so let the Spirit of God speak to your heart. Don't sleepwalk through when he's saying, Deal with this. But, but you don't understand, Pastor. I've tried to deal with, I've dealt with that addiction. I've dealt with that fear. I've dealt with that anxiety. I've dealt with that behavior or pattern. I, I've tried to start that new behavior. I've tried a hundred times. And I keep ending up back where I was before. Then it's time to try 101 times. Let this be the day that you say. Because what happens is the enemy will just say, put it on the back burner. Don't worry about it. No big deal. And God says, wake up. I want to complete something in you that I started, but there's more. And I'll tell you this, the closer we walk to the will of God and the closer we walk in the ways of God, we find more joy and more peace and more love and more comfort and more more meaning than we do living any other way. So then why don't we always just stay right in in line with God's will? I don't know. We're human beings. We we struggle. But Jesus continues to call us. He never stops loving us and he never stops calling us to wake up and to follow him. And then I, I believe that he wants us to recognize that if we continue driving, if, if I hadn't pulled alongside of my buddy Mark and honked, he might have run right off that road. But it wasn't just him in that car. It was two of my closest friends with him. And had he not woken up, he could have gone right off the road, flipped, and it could have ended really disastrously. I think part of the reason that Jesus calls us to wake up is he knows what happens if we don't. And, and in, this, in this passage, in the letter to the church, uh, he, he, he says, but if you do not wake up, this is, this is verse 3, the second half of verse 3. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. I don't believe that is a threat from Jesus. I think he's just saying, if you keep sleeping, I'm going to come. We're going to deal with this. So wake up. I don't, I don't, he's not saying, okay, I hope, you don't, I don't hope you wake up so I can sneak up and get you. That's not Jesus. But he's saying, I'm going to come. And if you don't deal with this, we're going to deal with this. You don't know when that's going to happen. So right now, right now, before it gets to that point, you know, repent. Seek revival before your boss finds out. Right? You know when you quit embezzling from work? You know when you should quit embezzling? The first time you think, I could take 20 bucks and nobody would notice. That's when you quit embezzling. Not when you're 50,000 deep. As a pastor, I've walked with people through all kinds of stuff. I've seen, it, I've seen everything you could imagine and a bunch of stuff you probably couldn't imagine as a pastor, the things that people get involved in. Wake up before your spouse and kids find out. Choose to repent now before it becomes public. Wake up, repent before the police knock on your door. That's the time to repent. Before your parents 
find out. Repent. Revive. Before the world finds out. Now when something goes on in someone's life, it becomes out there. Right? Doesn't even have to be true. And it can go out there. And it gets blown up. And so Jesus says, wake up. Wake up. Wake up. So we get the picture. We have a vision of this church, of the work of the Spirit, of God calling them to wake up. We have some lessons that we can learn. But here's where we end, getting a move on it. Taking action in our life and in the church. That we need to take action. It's not enough just to be aware. But we say, Lord, let this be the day that I now step in a new way into what you have for me. That I look at those areas that I've been struggling for, for, for weeks or months or years or decades and say, Lord, I want to live for you. I want to surrender to you. I want to see a revival. I want you to, to wake me up and breathe life in me in this area of my life. Whether it's something that I should stop doing or a good thing I should start doing. Whatever it is, God, I'm ready to respond. So I want to give you five declarations that I believe grow out of this passage. And I want to invite you to let the Spirit speak to your heart. If this, is, if this should be your declaration to God, will you make it your declaration? between you and God. And please don't nudge the person next to you on your couch at home or in the worship center and say, this one's for you. (laughs) Don't do that. Let the Spirit speak to your heart. Let God speak to your heart right now, this day, in this moment. And then seek to respond and walk in a path of revival. Here's the first declaration. We will wake up. It's time to stop hitting the spiritual snooze button. Is there an area in your life right now where, God, where you just need to say, God, I'm ready to wake up. There's this area of my life that, that I know it's time to wake up. It's time to start into or to stop this or that. But I just keep hitting a suit. 15 more minutes, click. 15 more minutes, click. 15 more minutes, click. And it's time to stop. So it's time to wake up and to look at whatever that is and to deal with it. What is that for you? I don't know what it is for you. But I can know what it is for me. And I can know what it is to say, I'm going to stop hitting the spiritual snooze button. I'm going to wake up. I'm I'm going to strengthen what remains and is about to die. Because because God says, I found your deeds unfinished in in my sight. Are you willing to do that? To to stop hitting the snooze button on hidden sin, on a poor attitude, on a lazy lifestyle. I'll get back to work. Click when it suits me. Instead of pulling your weight, doing your thing. The, 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 what, whatever it is, you know, God, God longs for us to be like him. I'm going to stop hitting the spiritual snooze button. Here's a second declaration. We will fortify, build up and strengthen our spiritual muscles. We said to God, I will fortify. This is what Jesus, wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. I will fortify. I will build up my spiritual strength. I will, I will say, for some of you, it might, this might be an area where it's, you've been hitting the snooze button. Well, I'm going to start digging into the scriptures. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open the Bible. I mean, I've been thinking for the last 30, 40 years, I should open the Bible and read it every day. I mean, I've heard that a lot from the Pope. And I, I'm going to start that soon. Click, 15 minutes, 15 days, next week. Next week, next week is usually translated never. Right? Because it's click, click, click. But, you know, say, man, there's almost nothing you could do to more fortify yourself and strengthen yourself to live for Jesus than know his spirit-breathed word. I'm going to jump into a precept upon precept class here at our church with Barb, who's been teaching it for years. Uh, Pastor Roy's wife, Barb, has been teaching precept upon precept for years. There's always, there's almost always a class going on. I'm going to jump in there. I'm going to jump into Bible study fellowship. I'm going to go to a women's Bible study, a men's Bible study, a small group. I'm going to start opening my Bible every morning when I wake up or every, every day at lunch at my break. You know, people say, well, if you don't read the Bible in the morning, you're not really a good Christian. The most, one of the most godly men I've ever met is Sherry's dad, Sherwin. For years at work, because he started work at like 4, 4.30 in the morning, he was up going to work. But at lunchtime, he would go to the cab of his truck and he'd open the Word of God. You mean you can read the Bible at your lunch break? Just read the Bible. right? Dig in. Let God speak to you. Maybe you've said many times, I I want to get more passionate about worship. I mean, I I go to church, but I don't really worship. I just kind of watch. Man, maybe this is the time. I'm I'm going to be generous. I'm going to be generous towards God's work just as soon as I have exactly enough in my life is comfortable snooze button and say, no, now it's starting time to flex that muscle. If you, want to, if, you, if you haven't been working out physically for 10 years, 
You're not going to go start, I'm going to start bench pressing 200 pounds. No, you're not. You're going to rupture everything and probably break your neck, right? You just start with the bar. Okay, I'm going to start, just lift the bar. Just lift the bar. Okay, there's nothing on it. It doesn't matter. This is what I can do right now. Start, I'm going to start being generous. Start today with something. Just nothing on the bar, but get used to it. And then put five pounds on each side. Ah, oh, I can do that. Put, 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 put another five on, and, and just exercise your spiritual muscles. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die, Jesus says. Strengthen it. Grow. Grow. I'm going to start serving. Start doing something. I've, I've meant to serve for years. Start doing something. Get engaged. Maybe you say, I, I'm going to do something for someone besides myself. Here, here's the thing. I'm going to get one bag of candy and bring it here for, for Shoreline's Fall Festival coming up this Saturday. I, maybe you've been part of Shoreline for 20 years and you've never given anything. Here's your first thing. Bring a bag of candy this week and drop it off and say, share this with kids. And you know what will happen? So you'll be like, ah, there's, it feels great to do something for somebody besides myself. Take that next step. Fortify yourself. We will. Here's the third thing you can declare. Remember what God has given and spoken. We will remember what God has given and spoken. Here's what Jesus says to the church. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard, and hold it fast. Then he says, repent. Remember what you've received and heard. I will remember that God has poured out grace and grace and grace on me. I will remember that I am in a friendship with God. Greater love has no one than this than they lay their life down for their friends, and Jesus did that for you. Remember that. I have a heavenly hope. Heaven is my home. This, this, this world is, is, is beautiful and wonderful. We can enjoy this life, but heaven is my home. Remember, you are a loved child. Remember who you are. Remember when God showed up and revealed his power in your life. You've had those moments. Take yourself back there and remember. Remember the time that God healed you. Remember the time that God delivered you. Remember the time that, that you were so broken and God came near you and comforted you and, you and you actually said to people, if it wasn't for the presence of God in my life, I wouldn't have made it. Remember, remember, remember. It wakes you up to who God is and who you are. Will you declare that today? We will remember what God has given and spoken. A fourth thing we can declare. We will, or I will, repent and turn from the ways I am not honoring God. I'm heading this way, I'm behaving like this, I'm thinking this way, I'm talking this way, and this is repentance and the power of Jesus. I turn around and I live the way he wants me to and not the way I was, I'm going his way, not that way. That's the call, repent. Jesus says, wake up. You're heading off the road. I love you too much to just look the other way. And then number five, we will hope. We will live with bold confidence in the eternal promise of salvation. To the one who is victorious, to the one, the one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white, Jesus says to the church. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. Where is your hope? Where is your hope today? Is your hope in the trends of what happens when the doctors say about the next week or month of what happens with COVID. Is that where your hope is based? Now that matters, but that better not be your source of hope or you're going to be like this, okay? Where do you place your hope? If we can just give, if my, if my team can be in charge of this nation, if my team gets to be in charge, then I can have hope. Don't base your hope on that because guess what? Boop, 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 right? What's your hope? My bank account, enough money, financial security. Is that your hope? God has opened a way for eternity. And through the blood of Jesus Christ has made a way that when you put your faith in him, you will be dressed in white and one day you will be introduced to God and the angels as a saved, loved child and follower of Jesus. I'm putting my hope there, folks. Because no one can take that from you. Amen? No one can take that from you. Oh, Lord God, this is our prayer today. As we listen to the voice of Jesus speaking to the church 2,000 years ago, it cuts through history and cuts through our hearts to today. And we hear the voice of Jesus. Jesus, we hear you speaking to us, saying, wake up. 
Repent, turn, follow me. God, our prayer is that every single one of us will identify at least one area that we need to experience revival and a fresh work of your spirit to repent and turn from the way we've been living, thinking, acting, or to turn towards a good thing that would be honoring to you. Lord, we pray that by the power of your spirit, we will wake up. We'll be light sleepers spiritually. And when you even whisper, that's not for you. Don't live that way. Don't go there. Don't do that. Don't say that. When you whisper, begin that habit. Start living for me. Start serving. Start, start being, being the person I've made you to be. When, even if you whisper, Lord, may we wake up and hear it and respond. For the glory of Jesus, for the sake of the world, and oh Lord, for the best possible life for us. Because living in your ways, Lord, there's nothing better. As we finish this time together, Lord, we know you're not finished with working in our hearts. Complete the work you're doing and make us more like Jesus. We pray this for his glory. Amen. Amen. Before I have you stand and send you off with a word of blessing, I want to give a couple of invitations, and there's some really neat things coming up, so please pay attention to these. And at home, this is, this is for you as well, all right? Uh, next Sunday, October 31st, we're going to have a different kind of worship service. I'm preaching. We're going to be going through the book of Revelation, but we're going to actually do it like one or two songs at the beginning, and then I'm going to preach... And then we're going to have a time of response after I preach. So like if you show up, I can show up at uh, 25, 30 minutes in and we're just finishing the music and then I'm here for the sermon. You'll miss a lot of the sermon if you come then. So some of you may need to come earlier. 9 o'clock this service, 11 o'clock the next service. But we're going to do a little opening stuff and then I'm going to jump into the preaching earlier. So you've been fairly warned. All right, that's the plan. Also, after the message, uh, we are going to have a time of response and worship. But also we're going to have a lot of our leaders available uh, and they're going to be ready to uh, anoint with oil. And if you request it to lay hands on you, I know people are at different places, and we'll have it online for people as well. We can't anoint you with oil online, but we can, but, but uh, anoint with oil, pray over you, and we're going to have a time of really focused prayer over some of the things we've been learning from the book of Revelation. And so for some of you that are at home, if you're at home because you have real health and safety issues, we understand, we love you, you're part of the family. If you've been at home just because it's convenient, next week would be the time to come back to church if you can do it, because we're going to have a very special time that will be different here on campus. We just can't extend some of those things. We'll pray for you on the phone, but it won't be the same. So, so be here on time next week for a great worship service. Also today, we have a baptism class, uh, three baptism classes, and if you have not been baptized, and you say, or, or you just say, I want to be baptized, it is so important, it is so powerful, and it's a decisive moment in your life as a Christian. And so today, uh, we have a class at 1015, here in the garden room, in person. And the garden room is right up the stairs here. So we actually have opened that door. If you go up these stairs, right up that door, you can go around up the stairs here. But the garden room right there after the service. Uh, and then a baptism class after the second service. And at one at 1.30 online. 1.30 online, we have a baptism class. And so that's coming up. This coming Saturday is our fall festival, our, our kind of our ha- uh, Halloween gathering for the neighborhood kids and community kids and our own church people. So from 1 to 4 o'clock, uh, Come join us, come in a costume, have fun, but also uh, and let, invite neighbor kids. Uh, kid-friendly games, trunk or treat, crafts, food trucks, inflatable slides, video, 20-foot screen, video games, a lot of fun. Um, and so come and be part of that. And if you want to donate candy between now and next Saturday or bring it then, that'd be great. We want to really bless the kids. Uh, if you need prayer, we'll have prayer today in the front of the worship center. So if you're on campus, come in the worship center. If you're online, as we always do, call the number or email your prayers. We'll pray for you. And if you're new, we want to welcome you. So if you're anywhere on campus, uh, join us. In the, go, just come right into the lobby. Go to the Connection Center. They want to give you a little gift bag. Thank you for coming. And if you're online, just text the word welcome to the number you see on your screen, and we will welcome you uh, as best we can online. If you're at home, in the courtyard, family worship venue, in the worship center, stand. if you're able to stand, will you stand? And will you, as you go into this week, may the God who knows you and who loves you May he continue to love you enough to say, wake up, wake up. And may you hear his voice. May you be a light sleeper when it comes to your spiritual life. May you experience revival and repentance and the power of God in you to become all that he would have you be and all that you long to be as his follower. God bless you. Have a great week. And we gather next week to continue in the book of Revelation. Have a great week.